Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Imperial as One's Belonging series, where we share and we learn about the lived ex experiences um, of individuals from the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Um, it's an opportunity for people to share their ideas or share their journeys as to how they gain their sense of identity and belonging. And I'm very, each week I'm, I'm more than happy to reflect on their journeys with them. And this week, you know what? I've got a really, really special young lady and her story is truly amazing. And that is Sheena Shah. Um, Sheena is a bioengineering student at Imperial College um, and she is a strong advocate for bone marrow donation and she will tell you why. So Sheena, I'm going to just say another big thank you for being our guest this week. I want to no. welcome you to... Thank you for having me on. So I'm going to start off by asking that, that question which I ask every week, which can you tell me what it was when you were growing up, which gave you your sense of identity and your sense of belonging? Um, do you know, I really, really thought about this and I've actually come to the conclusion that there really was no identity, you know? So um, uh, I think I've um, spoken in the past to you about the fact that when I was younger, you know, being an, an Indian child who has not actually lived in India, um, my culture, when I'm at home, the culture is very different to in school. So like at home, my whole family speaks Gujarati and speaking to them and they have lived in India and also lived in um, other countries that they've migrated to and eventually ended up in the UK. Um, but I'm a first generation in um, born in the UK. And so I have those cultural inputs from home. And then coming into school, it was a very British community in the sense that not many immigrants in my um in my um uh, friendship circle. So most people were their previous generations had all lived in the UK. So then I it, at school, I didn't quite feel like I belonged. Mm -hmm. So I think in either way, I was in like flip-flopping back and forth, you know, in between those sort of areas. So yeah, no, not really much of an identity. Um, so you felt a bit like an in-betweener. You, yeah. you, you compartmentalized what you did at home at, compared to what you did at school. Exactly. So, so how did, mm, I'm just wondering, how did that how did that make you feel about who you were and and how you you've got to where you, where you were especially as a as a young as a young child what was what what happened it also gets lumped into this thing of finding yourself and um it sort of like you just whatever way especially with my life and the twists and turns i've had mm -hmm. it's one of those things where you just know, you just you know, one day you're thinking this and you think, oh, this is my identity and this is how I feel. And the next day could literally turn that whole thing upside down. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it was, it's one of those things where I'm still on a journey of finding my identity. It's just never, ever concrete because I just, from what I've learned in my life is the next day, it could be totally different your Your outlook on life could be totally different. You could be in a different part of the world different things happening so yeah mm -hmm. so okay so you mentioned about being in school how was school for you did you enjoy school what what, what the identity from home which you did bring to school how did that manifest itself um I really really loved school my friends would um so a lot of my school years was sort of um I think uh, a lot of my friends would educate me about like um, home life so I got to learn what a Sunday roast was I had no idea what that was <laughs> and I'd also they'd always come to my house and eat Indian food and at school I um academically I wasn't very smart 
at school. So um, I really just, I didn't know at that time, but now I know I had dyslexia. Yeah. So I had no academic identity in the sense that, oh, I'm good at, I'm good at work at school. I was more of like a creative child where I loved to, all the art lessons. Yes, I'm in there. Drama. I loved drama. Um, so it was, it, all the creative aspects of school that was my in fact actually maybe my identity was more in the creative aspects of school you know those classes would just fly by my friendship group we would always um you know just sit at lunch talking about life I was to be honest I was always one for drama within school so I was always oh, what's happening with this person? What's happening with that person? It, I And still to this day, I am still a bit of a drama enthusiast. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> so um, that, that really, it really was... Um, school was just, you know, it was just school. You go, you... I'd sit in the hour, for an hour on the bus journey with my friend dissecting all of life. You know, what was happening at home? Who do we like? Do we like people who drive Range Rovers? Do we not like people who drive Range Rovers? You know, that everything, everything. And then um, it was just, it, school was just like something that go to get it done to move on to the next stage of your life. So then, you know, we're just itching to grow up and become like adults and go and experience life and um, have our own place, houses to live in and Go crazy. Yeah. So so what was your aspirations? What did the teachers, what were the teachers' expectations, aspirations? What were your parents' aspirations for you when you were growing up? So um, my parents never really, so it got, as soon as I got into secondary school and moved into secondary school, they took totally took the back foot. They were busy working both my mom and dad were at work most of the time and most of the time spending a lot of time with my grandparents mm -hmm. so summer holidays everything my grandparents sort of took the role of being my parents mm -hmm. and um it really the conversation never ever got to aspirations it was more driven by in school people were thinking about it and at that point in time I was like oh do you know what I, I think a lot of children go through this. I want to be rich when I'm older. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm going to pick whatever career pathway gets me to be rich or has a bit of prestige with it. And I never knew what I really wanted to do. So it was always like, I think at one point I wanted to be an investment banker. Mm -hmm. At one point, I was really good at finding out which which journey in life would lead me to the most money and then telling everyone that I'm going to do that. So, <laughs> so the, the, what about the teachers then? Because it, it sounds mm -hmm. like you had a kind of like a, a mindset of, you know what, I don't want to be poor, I want to be rich. Uh, did, the, did the teachers encourage that in any way or what? So I was also quite good. So we're talking about my life before um, my health issues and things yeah. like that. I, um, I was always quite good at telling everyone, but anybody who I felt would judge me because I was quite academically, academically, I was, it was just not there. My, my, edu my, um, I've always struggled with English um, and with my dyslexia, it just totally, I was always afraid that if I told teachers what I really wanted to do, mm -hmm. they would judge me mm -hmm. and they would be like, no, you can't really achieve that. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to, so I kept it quite quiet from people who I thought would know me truly in the sense that mm -hmm. my academics were not were not there at all but from everybody who couldn't judge me at all who didn't know anything about my life was yeah it was all there for them okay so you you kind of like hid your true aspirations because you didn't want people to say no you're not going to be able to achieve yeah? exactly so yeah. You, you just briefly mentioned there about the fact that you had some health issues. Can you um, explain how that impacted on your education? What, what were the types of health issues that you had? So I've had, um, so when I got to the age of 15, around 14, 15, um, uh, one summer, 
I was really, really ill and really, really tired. And um, we turns out, went to doctors and turns out I found out I had um, leukemia and specifically acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Mm -hmm. And that meant that I would have two and a half years of chemotherapy treatment. And that really, you know, it's the middle of your teens. You're just told, this is it. You need to come out. Of, look, they didn't tell me to come out of school, but it was like, this is going to majorly impact your life. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, you know, I remember the first thing when I got into that doctor's office, I asked them, um, does this mean that I don't have to do my education anymore? Because that for me was a bonus. Mm -hmm. I was like, this means I can get out of school and move on with the rest of my life done deal um and they were like no we're still gonna make you do your GCSEs and your if you're gonna get to your A-levels we're gonna make you do your A-levels too mm -hmm. but this is no excuse for you to not do those mm -hmm. and we're gonna be behind you every step so I ended up dealing with two and a half years of chemotherapy and the first like first couple of years was really impactful because I had to separate from all my friends all my friends were on that pathway of you know I think at that point in time in your life mm -hmm. a lot of people um in your teens you sort of separate from your parents you sort of become your own person you go out you do things like drinking with your friends you know yeah. crazy things going out but I got none of that I had to I was stuck to my parents more so I was more mm -hmm. dependent on them mm -hmm. than before mm -hmm. and so my pathway ended up going in the very total opposite direction to most teenagers and I ended up you know having to homeschool so the council sent home teachers to teach me at home and um, I would spend I would say a couple of hours a week getting educated by the um, council teachers and I think that point it really changed my life academically so those council teachers when they came home they really so I don't know what it is but some of those teachers they are definitely un, unsung heroes mm -hmm. they they saw my they you know they see you in your raw self so I was struggling with my health so I couldn't put on a face of this is me this is my um um, my academics and I couldn't um I also was really struggling so I had to depend on anybody anybody around me I was always depending on you know just to even move I would struggle to move my own body so to be able to that kind of led to a lot of you know depending on people so I had one council teacher who came home and she just looked at me and she said Sheena I think, you know, it's just people who believe in you. So these council teachers, they really believed in me. And they said, Sheena, I think we can do this. We're going to, I'm only going to use your energy wisely. And we're going to do this efficiently. And literally, she changed my life. She, she looked at my learning style. She put that energy into me. She believed in me. And now I'm at Imperial, one of the world's leading universities. And um doing bioengineering which is something I could have never dreamed of and uh yeah this teacher I'm still in touch with today because I just she's changed my life so much so um, um I think that all became my identity as well um after that point on I'm, I'm just amazed at I'm amazed at your tenacity for one but then in addition to that you mentioned about the fact that you you learn to become dependent on other people, yeah. You had to become dependent on other people, whether and it's I, I suspect as not suspect as a teenager, having to kind of like give up your autonomy, the little bit of autonomy that you're just starting to get, that can be really tough. So mentally, um, how did that impact on you? Because I know physically, your body was in turmoil. But mentally, how did that impact on you? It was, it's one of those things where you learn to not bite the hand that feeds you. Mm -hmm. It's one of those, um, so as a teenager, I used to, me and my mum, we never ever, because um, my mum and my dad were always at work. And then my mum said, you know what, I'm going to stay at home, I'm going to look after you. So she stayed at home and I've never, ever had to be in that close proximity to my mum for so long. Mm -hmm. And boy, we went through arguments. We went through everything. 
And now I would say from two people who possibly would have had a different outcome in life of not being close at all, we would have probably been quite distant. If I had to talk to my mum now, I would probably have some arguments, but we are now the best of friends. We went through, you know, you're forced to be in a position where you have to sit and argue it out until there's no outcome but to actually deal with one another and now can't live without each other. So... It's one of those, and I learned how to, like you said, learning how to depend on others. It comes with so many different mental aspects of if somebody, if you have no option to, for example, if I'm hungry and I wanted to get food from the kitchen, walking to the kitchen was a deal in itself or going to the toilet was a deal in itself. But in order to have somebody help you, you can't have no tantrums. You can't really bite the hand that feeds you. So it taught me a great deal of humility of, you know, if something's not, because you're very used to doing things your own way. If you're Mm -hmm. cooking your own food or doing this, you do it your own way. You're set in your ways. And if you have to tell somebody, it's like explaining to somebody how you would do what you're doing and using somebody else's body. You're using their body and you're the mouthpiece telling it, this is how I would do it. Can you do it that way? Mm -hmm. And I had to learn a great deal of humility. Things aren't always going to go your way. And everything else in my life was going haywire. So this was the only thing I could control, my home circumstances. And that was such a big, it was my mental health was in complete turmoil at that point. But now I would say I'm so much stronger as a result. And I've learned that sometimes, you know, like I said, you can't bite the hand that feeds you really. It taught me a lot. Yeah. I can I can just I can clearly understand that. Mm-hmm. Can you give me a, 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 a insight into you said that you had leukemia, right? Can you give me an insight into what that did to you um physically, right? Yeah. And, and the kind of of treatments that you had to have. Yeah. So um for one, uh physically, I think the most obvious thing that most people could notice is I lost all of my hair. I ended up losing it twice, but oh. I was actually okay with this change. A lot of people struggle with losing their hair. Now I was okay with this because my aunt had pre my aunt one of my aunts always had short hair. And she was always going on about how easy her life was with her short hair. And she always look, made it look cool. So prior to this, she we I went to the salon. I'd always go and get my hair cut with my arm. And she was like to me, and and one day I looked at her hair cut and said, I want that. So prior to losing my hair, I had experience with having short hair and all sorts of haircuts. So then when I lost my hair, it wasn't that big a deal to me. But around me, my whole family, it was that point at which they knew something was wrong. And that really, that was a struggle. I remember one day coming back from hospital and my hair was just falling out like so much when you go for a shower there would just be clumps by the drain and you're just like I've got to pick all of that out it's too much effort so I came and I said to my dad get that razor and just shave my whole head do it and my dad was like Sheena are you sure about this he was really it just hurt him so bad to have to sit there and go I'm gonna I'm gonna have to shave your head and I was like no do it do it and he really I had to hold his hand against my head and be like just do it I need it off because I don't care what I know it makes you feel really bad but for me practically it's not working right now so that was a tough tough point and then people seeing me I remember one of my cousins came and saw me and she just saw me she just broke down crying she just saw it and she was just like Sheena I cannot look at you the same way with your shaved head because it just hurts too much Mm -hmm. to see this is what you're going through so that was one part of it then physically in terms of my body so my treatment was two and a half years of chemo and in order to keep my blood um continuously um uh to keep my blood continuously growing my bone marrow continuously generating blood um and the chemo not killing all of my blood cells they had to give me loads of steroids Mm -hmm. and the steroids was one of the biggest impacts um on my body I would just knock me out I'd be on the sofa 24 7 and even to get up and go to the toilet I had to like convince myself I can do it it was that sort of mental toughness of 
do you know what Gina you have the energy to walk to the toilet and go to the toilet and I remember my mum would like convince me she'd be like Sheena I'll hold your hand we'll go to the toilet mm -hmm. like that sort of strength to actually get up and go and the steroids also changes your again with mental health it makes you more angry mm -hmm. um, more hot-headed so I would then have loads of arguments because the steroids would make me you know, everything else in my life's going bad and then the steroids, steroids would aggravate me and then on top of that it's um just a lot of sickness I've learned to you know vomit in a very neat way now because every shape or form place I go I'm always so mm. it's just so much impacts um lo lots of the muscles all the muscles I had had gone so you realize you all the small muscles it takes to even walk once you lose all your muscles you realize they have to build them back up again afterwards because everything's gone so it's it's a lot there was just a lot of um health issues there so, so were you so were you having to spend that time in hospital or were you were you coming home how how was your treatment managed were you an inpatient outpatient how was it managed for you um so i was a um bit of both so okay. at the start of my treatment I spent a whole um I think I spent a whole month inside of hospital and then every sort of month every I think every two weeks it started off with and I went to every month I would have to go in for a round of chemo big heavy chemotherapy and then once a month I would have to go in for a lumbar puncture in my back to check what's happening with the bone marrow and on top of that, they would put chemotherapy into my spine, which meant that I would have to go under general anesthetic or local, depending on how I felt. And um, they would put the chemotherapy in my spine. So I would that would be a whole process in itself. So imagine once a month being put under general anesthetic, mm -hmm. like a routine procedure. And then on top of that, chemotherapy that would wipe me out for the whole month. I remember looking back at my diary. Now I, I saved... Uh, I had a to-do list diary mm -hmm. and I remember like one day I'd open it and it would have a whole to-do list of what to do and oh, I'm going to do this for this week and that for this week and then I'd see it be blank for a whole month afterwards because that uh, maybe the day after or the week after I would end up going in for treatment and all my plans would be, just be blown out the window and I would um, it was just, just again the cycle repeats that every month I'd have two weeks out and then possibly one week of just getting back to normal again. Mm -hmm. And then again, and I would, um, when I come home every single day, I had to take um, chemotherapy pills as well before I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So I had that and it was just, and then on a Friday in particular, it'd be extra chemotherapy pills because that would be the day they'd decide to boost me up a bit more. And um, it was just chemotherapy everywhere, anywhere I walked, chemotherapy, I got I could smell smells that I um couldn't smell before. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where if you even going into the shops, if I saw a certain, you get very easily put off food, put on food. If I go to shops and I saw certain food, I would literally vomit because my body was so sensitive to everything around me. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Wow. So how effective was that chemo in in helping to to treat your? <laughs> or ALL, the acute lymphoblastic leukemia? Yeah. So two and a half years of treatment I had, and then for six months I was in the clear. Right. After that six months, I ended up um, get relapsing. So mm. they found out that I had leukemia again, and it had um, grown back. Is there any way we could remove um, Chris? Yeah, I can. Yep. Is it... So... Um, Basically, we um I had chemotherapy and um <clears throat> off, so after the six months of um illness, I then ended up um thank you very much for that actually. Um six months they um they found out I had chemo I had um leukemia again and we ended up having to um go back to hospital. I had um so I don't know if you know this, but for teenagers and for children, there's a um, chance to, you can make a wish and they grant, there's Make-A-Wish Foundation and they grant mm -hmm. any wish you want. Star And there's Starlight Foundation, which work with Make-A-Wish Foundation and they grant any wish you want. And I'd wished for a holiday 
because I hadn't been on an all-inclusive holiday. My parents were not those kind of people. There's the sort of people who book a flight, will go to a random, um, a random, uh, I don't know, like a random airport, yeah. and just with our suitcases, and they'll be like, right, we're going to backpack it from here. We're going to live rough and I was just like I want an all like a five star all inclusive I want the top top job I just want to relax on a holiday at least not come back at night feeling I need an, another holiday on top to recover from that so I'd wish for that and the day I was supposed to leave to go on holiday I went back to hospital and they said to me that morning they said to me you've got leukemia again and we, there's no you cannot go through chemotherapy again like you've been before you need to now have a bone marrow transplant and then there was the process of killing all of my bone marrow right and then once they'd killed all of my bone marrow that meant a lot of chemotherapy I then had to go on to um having my actual transplant and finding a donor was one of those aspect key, key aspects of that part of my life mm -hmm. so um yeah no that's why I'm currently um working with Imperial Marrow and trying to push for more people to join the bone marrow registry all right so before we we, we shift over to that to uh, that yeah because I think that that's amazing but I also want to just get a little bit more insight into um your body the, the chemotherapy which you had used wasn't effective it was effective yeah. for a short amount of time but now they had to effectively wipe out the whole of your bone marrow because it was generating the leukemic cells yeah yeah exactly so were you more prone to infections did you have to isolate from people more at that po at that point in time How yes yeah, so so when I had to go through my bone marrow transplant prior to going through my bone marrow transplant and during my bone marrow transplant, I could not see anybody. Even through my, my first set of chemotherapy for two mm -hmm. and a half years, I, I had to isolate. So that didn't that meant not going into cinemas, not mm -hmm. going into busy areas, going into restaurants. I had to check the restaurant had good food standards before I ate there. Um, all sorts, anybody who would have a cold, I would stay away or mm -hmm. any sort of a sniffle. So that meant a lot of family plans got cancelled and the people who I'd see, it, a lot of that got cancelled because everyone's catching a cold here and there. So, um, and then when I did the main, um, the bone marrow transplant, that meant total isolation, seeing nobody. And I could only see my mum and my dad and the nurses. And my brother would come in rarely because it was just too much of a risk. And so every day during my bone marrow transplant, I'd have the therapy to get rid of it. And then in the evenings, they would give me an immunosuppressant at night while I was sleeping. They'd give me a huge immunosuppressant that would literally wipe out the whole of my immune system. And from there afterwards, I had to really, after my transplant, I had to take really slowly integrating back into society. I think it took me at least a year or two years to try and get back into society fully and feel safe because my body rejected the bone marrow quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up having a lot of um, immune, um, uh, a lot of issues and immune complications mm -hmm. in the sense that I had to keep going back to hospital because my um, body was reacting to the bone marrow and they'd have to give me emergency um, antiviral medication to try and kill whatever my body was reacting to and I after the treatment it was a lot of that a lot of going in and you know getting a lot of nebulizers to then be able to like quote my lungs and protect my lungs from whatever was going on mm -hmm. so it's a lot that that aspect of the bone marrow transplant was one of the biggest aspects of it so yeah so, okay that, that, wow that's that's a lot to be contending with so throughout this whole time I'm assuming that you've already mentioned about the schooling aspect in terms of having home tutors coming in etc um but I'm also just really interested in knowing about how you, what did you, what did you feel, feel with, how long did it take for you to get a, a matching donor? Okay, so it took, see in that period of time, there was a lot going on and um, they tested my brother first mm -hmm. and my brother 
was not a match. Right. And so then my dad from that point just said, this is it. Because we'd heard from a lot of um, parents that had children had gone through this. Some children had survived. Some children didn't survive. Mm -hmm. And some children had um 50 percent matches some people had total matches mm -hmm. and some children had brothers donate sisters donate or an external person donate and so my dad was like under no circumstances are we going to let this go to chance i'm going to do whatever i can to help you mm -hmm. and he started a huge campaign around with anti nolan dkms i think i was their poster girl for at some point in my life mm -hmm. to um get more people signed up and he spoke a whole outreach community of um trying to get people signed up and it was really really um uh like a really really strong push but at the end of the day it's so hard to get a match that my match did not come from anybody in the UK I think it seems to be I haven't met my donor yet and I'm in the process of getting in contact it seems to be my donor was from outside of the UK from another country mm -hmm. and that my bone marrow had to be flown in to actually deliver to me so it came in like a cauldron like looking shaped vessel and they opened it up and they pulled out the small bag of stem cells mm -hmm. to put in me on the day mm -hmm. and that process imagine I had to go through the whole of the uh, mm -hmm. other countries to be able mm -hmm. to find this one person could be able to match me and there's quite a few um there was quite a few people they had I remember talking to doctors and there's quite a few people they had that could have been possible matches but a lot of people don't actually respond when they're contacted or there's a lot of different so out of let's say four people that could have possibly been possibly been a match one person didn't respond one person was on a business trip um, another person probably wasn't as good a match as they thought. And then this last person was my last hope from another country. And um, it took, I think it took a good amount of time. And I remember my um, treatment being postponed a bit because we were just mm. trying to find that person. So um, it was definite, I don't exactly know the time, but it was a long time enough to for me to have extra treatment to make sure that my body can maintain that, dampen down that bone marrow at the moment to keep it ready for that bone marrow transplant so so were there, were there any other kind of like um decisions which you had to make in addition to to having the bone marrow treatment in itself that was kind of like a, a last rule. were there other any health complications which you had to consider at that time um because your body mm. was in a state of weakness well, what other things were they saying you had to do? Yeah, so there's there was a whole load of decisions I had to make, loads of decisions. So for the first part of my treatment, I um so before I got relapsed, I had to make a decision whether I was going to go on um trial for my treatment. So what happens with trial is they're currently giving a standard treatment for everybody, but they want to make that treatment process easier for the patient and more. Um, successful mm -hmm. so they said to me you have the option to go on trial and for me in particular they were thinking about giving me the steroids all at the start of my treatment and then allowing that to have an effect rather than giving me steroids throughout and that steroids knocking me out every single month so I had to make a decision whether I was going to go on a non-standard treatment that was a big big decision for me to make between me and my um uh, me and my family you know talking to them and saying okay I need either I can make this decision and it may not go right and it's sort of if you make that decision you'd go on the non-standard treatment and you don't survive at the end of it you know will your family feel like oh we could have done that and it would have been better or we could have done that it would have been better so I spent a lot of time thinking it over and for me my family were like, maybe you should just play it safe. But for me, I just thought there's going to be somebody down the line who needs, who's going to need treatment and it's going to, it needs to be better than what it is now. So I'm going to go on standard. I'm no, I'm going, I'm going to go on trial to then help whoever's, whoever in the future is going to be having um treatment. So I went on trial and then they sort of randomized you to a standard group or non-standard. And I ended up 
going on trial, but then being randomized to a standard group. So I ended up having standard treatment. And even from standard treatment, I ended up relapsing. So then the second dis big decision I had to make was whether I wanted to keep my, have, have kids really. Mm -hmm. So basically they said to me after this treat, after the second, from when I was having my bone marrow transplant, they said to me, you're not gonna be able to have kids after this. So you can either cut out your ovaries and freeze them. And there could be possibly f future inventions that will allow you to have kids from that. Or you um, have no kids. And um, I, I really, my family didn't want me to go through any more um, procedures. And I personally didn't want to go through any more procedures to just, just to be able to have kids. Mm -hmm. Like I thought, really do I need to making such a big decision about my future but at the same time thinking do I really need to um go through this much hassle so I didn't I ended up um deciding not to get my ovaries cut out mm -hmm. and um, my family had told me do you know what you don't need you, you, you we're happy if you have kids don't have kids it doesn't make a difference to us mm -hmm. all that matters is your health Mm -hmm. And for me, I didn't want to cut that decision out so quickly in my life. Yeah. So then the doctor luckily said, well, now because you're waiting for a bone marrow donor, you do have time to be able to freeze your eggs. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, and also it's not ideal because I would, they, they want to try and eliminate that time between your killing your bone marrow and having a bone marrow donor. But they said, mm -hmm. do you know what? I think you could possibly donate your eggs and freeze your eggs. Mm -hmm. And for me, I thought my dad, really, my family, they just did not want me to have to go through any sort of stress, pain, struggle. They said, Sheena, really, we don't want you to feel like you need to have kids. You can always adopt. Like adopting is the way that we'd want you to go if you were to have kids anyways. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but I said, no, I, I just cannot cut this. If I have this opportunity, I'm not going to cut this out of my life because I just don't know what me in so many years time will think. Even though from a young child, like from a young age, I was always saying to myself, I'm going to adopt kids. I always thought I'm going to adopt. And even if I can have my own kids, I'm going to adopt. But I made the decision to um, donate my eggs and um, uh, uh, not donate my eggs and freeze my eggs. Yeah. And um yeah, so now um, I've uh, I do have eggs waiting, but the actual issue is when they defrost those eggs, will the eggs actually survive to then be able to um, use? Yeah. So, um, but right now, as a result of not having kids, I'm now actually going through, and um, I'm now actually going through menopause. So my body has broken all of those. Um, you know the reproductive cycles and now I'm going through menopause officially I'm, and um yeah dealing with menopausal symptoms so that's the vibe at the moment wow I don't even know what to say with regards to that because you're so you're so young and to be experiencing all of that how 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 does I suppose the question I'd say is how does that make you from what you've said I can clearly hear that you've spent a lot of time talking with your family and reasoning and going down the whole adoption but then there's always that element of you know do you ever think to yourself why me do you know what it's actually never it i can honestly say it's never crossed my mind why me <laughs> i've i've always felt like so I think it's sort of to do with my mentality growing up. My dad is one of those people who, you know, he could get hurt and he doesn't care or just continue going. Is mm -hmm. that, you know, we just can't sit and idolise the fact that this is happening and just get up and get going and we'll do it. And I've always used, a, I, and I'm, in some cases it's kind of a bad strategy, but also to know that there's a lot of people who are going through a lot worse than me. Mm -hmm. And... There are a lot of people who struggles in life, whether it is cancer or other things, is is a struggle that I do not want to be in. Mm -hmm. And part of me, it kind of makes me think, do you know what? I actually feel like what I'm going through at the moment is 
I'm actually lucky I've got family to support me. A lot of a lot of kids out there don't have families to support them. I remember when I was in hospital, there was a boy next to me. His family could hardly be there for him because he had um he just they, his family had other kids to look after. Just did not have his single mom looking after other kids. She just doesn't have time to sit in the hospital with her son and help him. And he was going through brain cancer and he was a teenager just like me who probably needed that that support but um I'm, I'm sure he was probably annoyed with my grandma putting her head through the curtain going do you want do you want this or do you want that I told my grandma to keep out give him some space but she was just like no we everyone in this ward is getting looked after so um yeah I know it's it's but you see so many stories and on the ward and you speak to so many people and you realize god I've got this bloody easy compared to you and I don't need to I don't, I, what, what am I complaining about? What am I, my family's here to support me. Everything's here. Um, I've just got to do my part and just be positive, look forward. You know, also you have to think, I think part of me thought about if I have a negative outlook on it, my family is just going to get intensified with my family. My family is going to have a negative outlook. If I'm negative, they'll be negative. The whole situation is not good. And I wanted to eliminate the possible parts where anything could go wrong or emotions could be impacted. And my part was just to be positive, you know, sort of in the worst way possible, enjoy the process as well. You know, when do you get to have everybody molly cuddling you? You know, you just mention of this mention of the C card and it's like, yep, I would like that benefit and that privilege. And on the ta on the teenage ward as well, they were incredible. You had um staff that would help coordinate activities. Obviously, I couldn't take part in many because I had to be isolated. Mm -hmm. But they would always, you know, just be there for me. And the teenage cancer teenage cancer trust foundation, mm -hmm. they just make that ward seem fun, lively, entertaining. The nurses every day conversations just to keep me stimulated. And they'd talk about their lives and be like, yeah, I'm up to this this weekend or I'm going and doing this run. And yeah. and you just, it's just people, small people around, people around you who don't get talked about and they're the ones who keep you going. Yeah. You know, you, the level of maturity that you have and the outlook, that positivity, I'm just amazed. I'm, Thank I'm, you. No, I'm, I'm amazed and I'm inspired. I, I need to tell people how I met Sheena. I was walking through the corridors of Imperial and I saw one of my students who I'd seen previously um, at an event a couple of weeks ago um, working with um, Imperial Marrow, um, the student marrow donation um, group. And um, I stood up and I said, how are you doing? And then we were just having our little conversation and I turned to Sheena and she said, it's so important that people get a bone marrow donation or, or register to, to be a marrow donation donor. And I said, yeah, I agree. And she said, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a bone marrow donation. And I'm a living example. All right. But you're more than a, you are a living and an advocate, but you're so much more. You're a, you're you. In, you you really are an inspiration. I've in the few days that I've been inspired by you, and um, your positivity. What would you, what would you say to other people, especially from from our communities who seem to be so reticent and so, um, unwilling necessarily to engage with the process of donation? What 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 would you say to them? You know, it's one of these things that cancer is now affecting everybody. Mm -hmm. Cancer is, you you look to your left, you look to your right, there is going to be someone there who is affected by cancer. And uh, these families, when they go through it, it's not easy, especially if you have a child who's, you know, you just imagine the world for and they're going through cancer and they can't find a donor. It really is the end of the world. And only when a lot of these families are affected personally, they really start to take it seriously. And I'm saying you can start taking it seriously now. It doesn't, you don't need to wait for somebody near you to be impacted. You can start helping whoever it is out there who needs it, especially with blood donation, 
bone marrow donation, things like that. These in the future, you just never know it could be you mm -hmm. in this position. And is people like Bone Marrow Society, those generous volunteers, I'm shocked some of them are standing there because none of them, quite a few of the people on the committee haven't actually been impacted by this. And I've asked them, what makes you stand here and go up to people and be like, and it's a lot of rejections we get. And at the same time, a lot of people signing up because they get it. But a lot of rejections we get. And I get, how do you stand here, even though you don't have such a close connection to it, and deal with those rejections and still come back every day and want to sign people up? And they're just like, we know cancer is going to be a bigger thing. And we want to help people. We see the impact it makes. You know, we want, even though it's not going to come to me one day, uh, uh, even though I'm not impacted by it personally, I just want to help people. And this is what we're trying to inspire people to realize that it's one day it possibly could be knocking on your door and you just need to get out there, especially ethnic minorities. We need to get people on that map, on that registry. Absolutely. How many people, I met you on, on Wednesday um, and I know that you, you were at one spot. I turned around and there was another, I saw them, it's like you moved around the college until you found the spot. How many people did you actually manage to sign up on your... So after, after I would say two weeks of solid hard work at Imperial, we have managed to sign up 117 people and it's just amazing. We just love it. Fantastic. I'm, and, you know, that, that really, that really make, heartens me because I think, young students you know, the prime age for giving good donations you know i think that, yeah i think that that's really amazing and your efforts i believe should be celebrated and the efforts of your society should be celebrated because you're and recognized recognized and celebrated because what you're doing is very impactful very impactful. only only one percent of those people will be asked to mm -hmm. come and donate mm -hmm. only one percent of people joined up worldwide mm -hmm. will be asked to donate so mm -hmm. it's really tough to get a match so that even though it's 117 people we need more yeah. and it's we're just making those steps forward even though it's a big big fight we gotta fight it's just small steps and we'll get there eventually mm -hmm. but we need people and it's just those people who stop by even though they're on their way to a lecture they're like you know what i've got 10 minutes to stop by I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And we have the stand, even if you just want to come for a chat, just come and say hi. And if you want to learn more, we'll t educate you a bit more about it. You know, everything. Just if you want to share your personal experiences as well, we'd love to hear it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, definitely. Sheena, I've got a couple more questions. I don't know if there's any questions from the audience and we are kind of like slightly over time. But if there is any questions from the audience, then please raise your hand and I'll come to you. But I wanted to just ask one question, which was, how would you say that your cancer has, or not your cancer, your recovery has impacted on your sense of belonging? Um, it's, it's, it's hard because I think a lot of the times I think to myself, do you know what, maybe it's the cancer that defines me it doesn't define me but my recovery from it defines me but honestly speaking it's that humbleness it's brought to me not saying that I'm a humble person but <laughs> but it's that humbleness is brought to me of teaching me that everybody's life you know you meet so many people along the way and you realize that people there's everybody has their own merits like the teacher who helped me the council teacher who came and saw me and believed in me and said do you know what Sheena we can we can do this or the um nurses or my friends who I met at university who embraced me even though I'm an older student because of all my health issues I've had to take three years extra mm -hmm. um but those people at, at university who meet you, you know, when I was younger, also, I think a lot of people feel like they haven't found their people or met their people. But at some point, if it's meant to happen, you will meet your people and you will feel like you are you. And just feeling more self-confident that I can do this and having that belief. A lot of people don't have that belief in themselves or, you know, push themselves to 
those great expectations. So honestly speaking, I think my recovery has taught me that there are people who is not, don't be afraid to ask for help. There are people who are going to help you. And on top of that, there are people who are going to, you you know, you're just going to get on quite all right with. So, and you will be able to do it when you put your mind to it. And when you, if you're put in a position to do it, you will do it. And if the stars align, it's all going to work out. So there's always light at the end of the tunnel. That's what my dad always said to me when I was going through treatment. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. No matter what it is, there's always light. So that's um, and, and, really and, and, I, I love that. I love that. Your positivity is amazing. It really yeah. is. Um, I'm going to ask you my final two questions then. And they are, um, I don't, because uh, you're, I think, compared to me you're so young right so I don't but this 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 question is what advice would you have given to your younger self and then the flip side of that is what do you think your younger self would have said looked at you now and said wow so the advice I'd give to my younger self I think a lot of people would say this just don't care as much you know what other people think you know just like uh, be yourself be uh, obviously now I think I'm a bit more myself and sort of don't care as much what people think but when I was younger definitely don't care as much and I'm pretty sure most people would say that to their younger self now looking back at it in hindsight that well that issue wasn't that big as I as big as I thought it was going to be mm -hmm. and um looking at my um me looking as a younger child looking at my future self do you know the fact that I just I feel amazing you know every time um my family gets approached by uh, our family members everybody saying oh what happened to your daughter like is she okay by cancer and now they can say to the, those people my daughter's doing amazing and she's at imperial and she's inspiring others and she's getting people registered in Burma registry they just the smile on their face that just makes me go wow and the fact that I feel like I'm just doing what I want to do and what I feel like I can do and um, meeting people like you Mitchell I mean Wayne no, sorry <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> That's... and it's it's literally just meeting people like you and um, Maria from Imperial Marrow and just people who just inspire me every day with their just pushing against a bigger cause that it just you just may not see the light at the moment but you know there will be light yeah, you know, so yeah. Yeah. Gina, I I really could just sit and talk to you. I think your your as I said, your outlook is so refreshing for someone who's gone through so much. There's that level of positivity which is just beautiful. And you know what? As long as I can support you and help you in any way, then I really am here to to do that. We as a society are here to help you. You know. Oh, thank you, thank you so yeah. much. You 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 to you are to be applauded. And with your studies, doing your bioengineering, it may get tough at times, but, you know, it's an amazing story that you've shared with us today. And I want to just mm -hmm. say a big, big thank you. All no, right. thank you for having me on. Thank you for stopping by and, uh, you know, giving us motivation every time you walk past that stand. Keep going, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to yeah. just let people know what we're going to do for next week. But um, then afterwards, we'll we'll stop the recording and, and we'll we'll have a little bit of a conversation so for next week um what we will our guest for next week will be i think it's come up yeah our guest for next week will be charlotte pendergrass who has 20 years over 20 years of experiences in working in the education sector and she's an educationist and the ceo of a charity called southside youth leaders academy and so she's going to be our guest next week and sharing her stories and her experiences of helping young people in their pursuit of leadership and education. So please join us next week for that. And if you have missed any of the other um, episodes of Belonging, and there's quite a number of them now, um, please go to our YouTube channel, which is tinyurl.com forward slash belonging dash IAO. And you'll be able to hear this and many other really exceptional people who have been willing to share their stories. Um, as I said, 
there are all of these people who have shared their stories of belonging and in a week where people are questioning what does racism mean etc and things like that i'm so glad that we've got people who are willing to speak up and speak their truth so that people can understand exactly what it means to be a person of color in this country and so until next week have a good weekend and um continue to find your place to belong thank you